morning. Welcome to Community Chapel. My name is Art Platt. I'm one of the elders at the Community Chapel. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and the father figures. 2 Corinthians 6.18 And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Psalm 103.13 says, As the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a beautiful sunny day. Thank you for this place that we come and gather. We just thank you for fathers and father figures, Lord, that um, such an important part of society, Lord. And, uh, regardless of uh, the situation, Lord, we always have you as the ultimate father to look to. Uh, you're loving, you're compassionate, uh, and you discipline us when we need it. Lord, you're, you're just the, the ultimate father, and we thank you for that, that we can come to you uh, in every situation, Lord. Uh, we just thank you uh, for this day and the blessings that you bestowed upon us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you're able and sing with us. You been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood? I heard about his healing a 
of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought me to the victory oh victory in jesus my savior sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of
seated. At this time, we'll continue our worship with our offering.
cried as I stood there in the water up to my chest. Thank you, Pat. Heavenly Father, because you live, we can face tomorrow. And because you live, we can have no fear. Lord, just thank you for blessing us with this place, calling us here. Thank you for this new day, beautiful sunshine. Lord, thank you for all the things we have, material and spiritual, Lord, that come directly from you. As we give back just a little bit of that, Lord, I just pray that the, they, these gifts would be used to bring people to you, Lord. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Um, we had like a little bit of a Gaither hoedown earlier there, didn't we? That was fun. And it was Stephen who picked the songs this week, so even more fun. 
Thank you, Pat, for that song. It sets up what we're going to talk about today very, very nicely. We're going to talk about baptism. And uh, for some of you, you've been baptized and you don't maybe think this message applies to you, but hopefully it will and you'll be able to take some some truths home. But before that, let's just uh, take some time for prayer. Almighty God, we come to de- together today into this place with grateful hearts for who you are, that you created us, that you redeemed us, that you sustain us, that you are faithful to us, God. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life away, took our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is in this place and who teaches us and directs us and helps us to live lives that are pleasing to you. We pray for your spirit to be here and to bless this time together as we open your word, that we would learn what it is you would have us to learn today and be focused again on your truth and your righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I will uh, share with you that my wife and stepdaughter are helping my wife's sister move down to Tennessee today. So they're en route to Tennessee, somewhere probably in the middle of Pennsylvania by this time. And um, uh, she'll be coming back on Thursday, flying back on Thursday. So um, that's that's where part of my family is today. Now, if your name is John the Baptist, you kind of are pigeonholed into what your career is going to be, aren't you? You know, you, you just, you really don't have a choice. You, you got it. You, you got, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be baptizing people. And so he did it. And he set up shop along the Jordan River and began to baptize people. And it wasn't about um, a little sprinkle on the, on the, the head, you know, like bro cream, a little dabble do you. This was full go. This was full immersion baptism, dunking people under the water and bringing them back up out of the water. That's what what John the Baptist was doing. Now, imagine you're walking by and you're seeing this happening, and you think to yourself, I wonder what's going on there. You see this kind of weird-looking dude uh, lowering people into the water. Maybe you think it's sort of a, you know, uh, advanced, severe form of, you know, first aid or CPR training or something like that. But if you're a Jewish person, you look at what's going on and say, I, I know what that, I know what that is. That's a, that's a ritual immersion because that was part of their history. Part of their experience was that you had to be clean before you came into the presence of God. And so they had set up these forms of ritual immersion uh, for people to engage in before they went into the presence of God. So that was their reference point. It's not about personal hygiene or cleanliness. It's about spiritual cleanness. In fact, in uh, Psalm 24, verse 3, we read these words, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, and who does not lift up uh, or trust in an idol or swear by a false god. An author by the name of Robert Cargill notes that basically what Christians did was and is to take this form of ritual immersion from the Jewish faith and transition it or adapt it to be uh, our Christian ritual of baptism, which is sort of about cleanliness, but also about the symbolism of the old being gone and the new being who we are. We are buried in baptism and raised to new life in Christ. And that's what baptism is about. In fact, Colossians 2, verse 12, and then uh, Romans 6, verse 4, we'll look at later, uh, talk about that. It's about being lowered into the water that represents death and raised out of the water, which represents new life. And so it's more than just getting wet and uh, drying off at the end of the day. It's about a, a symbol about your new life and your relationship with Christ. It's being immersed. Now, what is immersion? We have at our home an immersion blender. Immersion blenders are a great little device if you're making a big pot of soup or a stew and you've got all your 
ingredients in there and you want to blend them together without making a huge mess in your kitchen and sloshing the stuff into your regular blender, you put this immersion blender in. It's got a little motor and a blade on the bottom. It's, it's like a little motorboat in your soup, you know, going around there, blending everything up. And it, but it has to be in the soup. That's what, it, that's what immersion means, being in it. And for us, we are engulfed. We are enveloped. We are uh, saturated when we're baptized, we're immersed in water, but we're also immersed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at a, it's a passage, and I, I didn't put it on the slides today. You can look at it on your device or your Bible. Uh, Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17, which records the story of Jesus' baptism. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now, for it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Notice that all three persons of the Trinity showed up for Jesus' baptism. His family came to his baptism. Really nice of them to do that. Had the Father there. Of course, he was at his baptism. And the Holy Spirit came too. So the three persons of the Trinity were at the baptism. And the question that gets asked a lot and is worth pondering is, why was Jesus baptized? When we're baptized, we understand it. We're immersed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But why would Jesus have been baptized? I want us to think today a little bit about that idea of immersion. What does it mean to be immersed? When we're immersed, what does it mean? And we're going to start with we're immersed into the Father, into the Father's love. 1 John 4 verse 16 says, God is love. That's a defining characteristic or quality of God. There are many attributes of God that you could talk about for days and days and days. But 1 John 4, 16, John just chose to say, you know what? This is a good definition of God. God is love. And so he gave us that definition. And at Jesus' baptism, he reminded, God reminded Jesus of his, not only his identity, but his relationship. He said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What life-giving words God gave to his son. And as parents, and it is Father's Day, happy Father's Day, but we have the opportunity to give life-giving words to our children. And I'm sure many of you have done that in your life. Life-giving words. The best life-giving words are, I love you, <laughs> and meaning it. Those are incredibly life-giving words. When my daughters were little, they'd get on the school bus, and I'd have silly things that I'd say to them, but it was always punctuated by, I love you, I love you. What a wonderful treasure we can have, the assurance of being loved. When we're immersed into the Father, we're immersed into his love, and we experience what Brendan Manning calls and what you've heard me say many times, our hearts are seized by the power of a great affection, seized by the power of of a great affection. G.K. Chesterton spoke of the, quote, furious love of God, unquote. And Rich Mullins, a songwriter, Christian songwriter, pushed even further into that when he spoke of the, quote, reckless, raging fury that we call the love of God. Those are not adjectives that we customarily associate with the word love. Reckless, raging, fury? That sounds not like love. But if you think about it, it talks about the fact that there's a passion, there's a commitment, there's a tenacity in the love of God, a tenacity that doesn't give up on us, and we are immersed in this constant, unchanging love, almost as if God's love is out of control, a torrential river swollen by rain that just can't control itself, that God can't help but loving you. I find great solace in that. God's reaction to his people is to love them. 
And yes, when we sin and when we fail, to be heartbroken over that, which is why he sent his son Jesus to die for us. But he can't help but loving us. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says these words. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. And then in, in uh, 1 John 3, 1, we see it says, what, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Great words to be reminded of in terms of our understanding of God's love. And then in Romans 8, we're reminded of the fact that Paul goes on in great detail to describe the love of God at the end of that chapter. And he says, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? There's nothing. Nothing. That's how powerful God's love is. And then we come to that wonderful prodigal son story in Luke 15 where the the kid says to his father, Dad, could I have my inheritance now? Which was tantamount to him saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have your money. There's some love. And then the kid goes out and wastes it and pilfers it away and, and comes back with his tail between his legs. And what does his dad do? Does he rub his nose in his failure? He's so happy to see his son that he runs to him, he sees his repentant heart, he embraced him, and he celebrated him. I have a bit of a similar story in my life, and I always hesitate to tell these personal stories because you might think that I was just like a perfect little angel my entire life, and I wasn't. I had some problems. My father was a loving man, but he was a strict man. He was a no-nonsense kind of guy. This is how it's going to be. This is how we're going to do it. And I was fine with that to a point. And his ministry was, he ministered in the inner city, which is where we lived in Ohio. Uh, We we lived in a rescue mission, which is where he served. And his ministry was to help down and out men who had been messed up by alcohol try to get their feet under them again, get back on their, lo- uh, on their legs. And, and he'd give them, we gave them food and lodging and clothing and helped them find jobs and those kind of things. That was my dad's ministry. And candidly, I got to tell you the truth, it was heartbreaking. My dad was heartbroken many times in that ministry. I watched it. But because of that context, we were teetotalers in my family. If you ask my dad... Point blank, do you think alcohol is evil? He would say, absolutely. Alcohol is evil because of his experience. When I was a freshman in high school, I had a pretty big disappointment in my life when our, the youth pastor that I'd become friends with was killed in, in a canoeing accident. He was drowned. And, you know, I'd been okay up until then, and all of a sudden I got turned, turned around. I got lost and confused and I still believed in God. I still prayed, but I just didn't know what to believe anymore. John was a great guy and had been taken so, so soon in his life. I ended up with a crowd of kids in high school that were doing things that high school kids shouldn't do, but they do. And uh, I got into some drinking alcohol, for one thing. Came home one night after doing that, after partying, and I was pretty wasted. And um, fortunately, my mom was away at a ladies' retreat. I would have hated for mom to see that. But dad saw it and knew exactly what was going on with his stupid son. And I would imagine my dad spent a lot of time that night praying, saying, God, what am I going to do with this knuckleheaded kid of mine? Next morning... I woke up, he came into my bedroom, he looked at me and he says, well, Jim, when you get your chores done, when you get your work done, because we all had work to do around the mission, he said, when you get that done, he says, then we're going to go out golfing, because I think you could use the fresh air. Boy, was he right. I was expecting for the other shoe to drop at any moment. The other shoe never dropped. And to this day, I look back on that moment in time and realize that my heavenly father loved me through my earthly father. He showed me great love. He showed me great patience. He knew I was in trouble. And I mean, I was expecting to be locked up and 
grounded for the rest of my life, even now. But that didn't happen. That's the kind of love the Father has for us. When we are immersed into the Father, we are immersed into His love. The second idea is that we're immersed into the Son, which means we're immersed into His righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, when Jesus came to John and asked John to baptize him, Jesus was hesitant, wasn't he? And and I would have been too. He says, "I, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Hmm. And then... They talked for a little while. That's an important question. As I said earlier, why was Jesus baptized? Because baptism is for repentance, for forgiveness of sins. Jesus didn't need to do any of that. He was perfect. So why was he baptized? Well, Jesus responded to John's hesitancy by saying, let it be so now. It is proper to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was fulfilling all righteousness. What does that mean? Well, at Christ's incarnation, he took on our flesh, he took on our limitations, but he also took on our sins. And so Jesus' baptism was, in essence, the initiation of his ministry. It was the starting pistol, so to speak, of his ministry and anticipated his sacrifice for sin through which we could be declared righteous. Jesus' baptism foreshadowed his death, and his, uh, which he suffered for us. In fact, for Jesus, baptism was anticipating the cross. Here's what he said in Luke 12, verse 50. He said, I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. I mean, Jesus, you've already been baptized for one thing, and baptism, it might be uncomfortable, but it's not that bad. But that's not what he was talking about. He was using baptism to indicate his death and his, his passion that he would go through. And so at Jesus' baptism, he declared his intention. By being baptized, Jesus was declaring his intention. I'm going to do what I've been sent here to do. I'm going to fulfill the Father's will. I'm going to complete the task that he's given me to do. And, and I'm going to die for the sin of the world and become the substitutionary sacrifice so that God can declare people righteous, which is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So by his baptism, Jesus acknowledged that we are fallen and that we need to be redeemed and he would identify with us in his death, uh, by his death to, to, for our sin. The exact opposite happens when we are baptized. Jesus' baptism, he identified with us and our fallenness. When we are baptized, we identify with him and his his righteousness. It says in in Romans 6, 4, we are therefore therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may live a new life. It's giving a very picturesque description there of what happens in baptism. When we are baptized, we are lowered into the water, which is why we do full immersion, plus the fact that the word baptizma means to to dip in under. So it's being lowered into the water to represent or signify our death to, to sin and being raised to new life. Baptism is a vivid representation of this. Now, Paul went on to clarify in um, Galatians 3 uh, the idea of being immersed in his righteousness when he said, as you see on the screen there, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You're baptized into Christ. You've clothed yourself in Christ in his righteousness. Now contrast that with what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 64, 6, when he said these words. He said, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, a pile of filthy rags. That's what our righteous acts are like. One of the jobs I used to have at the mission where my dad worked was sorting clothing that had been donated. I couldn't believe how much clothing was donated. And I felt like saying, you people are buying too many clothes. If you have all these clothes to donate to us, stop buying clothes. 
And I think that impacted me for the rest of my life, because if you'll notice, I have a couple of outfits that I wear and I rotate. I don't have many clothes. I have too many clothes for my taste, but that's just how it is. I'm very simple in that regard, and maybe it's because of my past in that regard. But we'd get these huge garbage bags full of clothes, and we'd open them up and go, oh, sometimes they stunk, they were soiled, they were tattered and torn. And we just wanted to say, you know, you could have thrown these in a dumpster. We didn't have to do it. You didn't need a middleman. You didn't need to pass these through us so we could throw them in a dumpster. And so we would have to then, we'd try to salvage whatever was salvageable out of all these clothes and, and clean them up and size them and then put them on the rack so the guys could come in and, and get clothing when they needed it. But it, uh, every time I read that verse, Isaiah 64, I think, I remember those big old bags of tattered, stinky clothes. Filthy rags, filthy rags. We who have put on our faith in Christ have been clothed in Christ's righteousness. So when God sees me, when God sees you, he doesn't see the filthy rags of your righteousness. He sees the righteous garments of Jesus Christ. He doesn't see my vain attempts to be righteous in my own strength. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see my frustration at not being able to, quote, get it right, unquote, because that happens regularly. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And thank God he does. Baptism represents immersion into Christ's righteousness. And the third thing and final thing in this passage, obviously we're at the third person of the, of the Trinity, is immersion into the Holy Spirit. Immersed, We're immersed into his power. It says in Matthew 3, 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Holy Spirit came as a dove. What do you think of when you think of a dove? Just a little bird flapping around, not causing too much problem, just unobtrusive. But then what do we read in Acts chapter 2? When the Holy Spirit came that day, on the day of Pentecost, it says, that it was the blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven. Not so much a dove anymore. A violent wind that just came in power to say, this is changing. Things are changing. People are going to be empowered and equipped to accomplish God's will. And in Acts chapter 2, uh, in that same passage, Peter had given a whole detailed explanation about what happened on the day of Pentecost. And the people respond by asking, well, what, what do you want us to do? What should we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of even confusion about what, what's the Holy Spirit's role? What's the ministry of the Holy Spirit? And, you know, so many different points of view on that and about the process and about the semantics and terminology. You can really get, you can really get bogged down in all of that. But I want to try to give you a picture that maybe is a little more clear and, and, and straightforward from Scripture. And that is the first thing is when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and lives in us. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 1.13. He says, when we believe, we are marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes and says, got you. you. You belong to God. That's what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is. And then at a subsequent point, and that word subsequent is tricky because it can be Right away, it can be at a later point in time. We have this experience of that we call in the Christian and Missionary Alliance a crisis experience. Crisis means that we kind of come to the end of ourselves and we say, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need God's power. And so then we open up to God for the filling of the Holy Spirit, which we read about in Ephesians 5 and verse 18. And that's an ongoing process, as you've heard me say many times, because daily we need that. We need to be open to the Holy Spirit's 
filling in our lives. And God uses his spirit to give us power to live lives that please him. As it says in 2 Timothy 1.7, the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So as we submit to the Holy Spirit, then, and allow him to fill us and control us, things start to change in our lives. Because we're no longer depending on ourselves to please God we're depending on the spirit. So when we feel hatred towards somebody, which is easy, especially when we're driving down a road and they're going five miles too slow for us, feeling hatred for that person for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit helps us to feel love. When we're unhappy, when we're sad, the Holy Spirit can infuse joy into us. When we're feeling restless and upset, the Holy Spirit brings peace. When we're frustrated and angry, the Holy Spirit helps us to be patient. When we're inclined to be mean, the Holy Spirit brings kindness. When we're inclined, uh, when we're tempted to give in to sin, the Holy Spirit brings goodness. When we're tempted to give up, the Holy Spirit helps us to be faithful. And when we're feeling like letting someone have it, the Holy Spirit brings gentleness. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's his fruit, not our fruit. That doesn't come from inside of us. It comes from the Holy Spirit in us. And when we are immersed in the Holy Spirit, we are immersed into his power. So baptism is being immersed in water to symbolize our death to sin and our being raised to new life. And it reminds us that we are immersed into God's power, into God's love, rather, into the uh, sons, into Christ's righteousness, and into the Spirit's power. That gives great security. Think about that. We are immersed into the love of God. Nothing can separate us from that love. We are secure in Christ's righteousness. Our standing before God, not dependent on us, not depending on us, dependent on Jesus Christ alone. And we are secure in the Holy Spirit's power. He gives us what we need to live lives that honor him. God wants us to be immersed into his love, immersed into Christ's righteousness, immersed into the Spirit's power. And baptism is a symbol of that. If you would like to take this important step, this is all about uh, if you would like to be baptized, we, have, uh, we can accomplish that very quickly. If you've looked out in the back, Art has that pool looking like a brand new pool. <laughs> it looks great. It looks fantastic. And uh, it's ready to, to be uh, used for various things, but I'd like to use it for a baptism this year. So if you'd like to be baptized, come and speak to me. I have a little form that I'd like you to write down some answers so I understand what your understanding of baptism is, and then we'll set a date and move forward with that. Let's bow together in prayer. I'd like you to just take a moment to reflect on when you were baptized. Maybe relive that in your own mind. And ask, how has today's teaching maybe reconnected you with that experience? As you think about being immersed into the Father's love, into the Son's righteousness, and into the Spirit's power. So often, Lord, it's easy to think of our faith as a religion, as something that's outside of us. It's over over there when we need to have access to it, but we can we can do without it in our lives, we think. We're kidding ourselves. But help us to realize that what you really want is for us to be immersed into you. And baptism is a symbol of that. You want us to be immersed into your love and into your righteousness, Lord Jesus, and into your power, Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would help us to uh, respond as you would have us to respond to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond by singing together, and if you're able, stand and join us.
as you go, may you experience the fury of God's love, the assurance of Christ's righteousness, and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. A few announcements. So next Sunday, after right after church, we're going to have a cookout. Um, the pool should be available for swimming. If you choose to do that, um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and you can talk to Gina if you'd like to bring something for the cookout. Um, and she just says, hot food uh, needs to be in a crock pot. Also, next, uh, this coming Saturday, the 25th at 10 a.m., we're going to have a work day um, to prep for the picnic and camp. So there's going to, we need weeding, uh, bathroom cleaning, the bathrooms down there, uh, furniture set up and cleaning. Let's see, also uh, VBS July 18th to 22nd, uh, if you'd like to volunteer, see Jen. Uh, also, there's a mowing schedule, if uh, you had time and the inclination to help out mowing a little bit, you could put your name there on the schedule. Uh, I think that's all the updates. Now Jim has an update on the...